Well, right. thank you all for coming. Um, I know this was somewhat last minute notice, so it's great having all of you here for really what is one of the great crises of our times that I think we tend to forget often is the great crisis of our time. Um, I think, it, just to kick this off, we, I'm Nina Easton with Fortune Magazine. Uh, I think we all read the headlines last month uh, showing that the national debt, the federal debt, is now equal to the size of our economy, which is pretty, pretty uh, astounding, over $15 trillion. Um, President Obama's 2012 budget shows the debt soaring to $26 trillion a decade from now. Uh, you have to go back to World War II to see those kinds of numbers in terms of percentages. Um, just three decades ago, uh, the national debt was about a third of the size of the national economy, just to give you a sense of what we've been through in the last three decades. We're honored here to have really four people who have been at the center of this debate in Washington. I know it just from covering it from my end. I've watched all, all four of these veterans very much uh, do yeoman's work trying to ring the bells, ring the alarm bells. Senator Mark Warner uh, needs no introduction. Senator from Virginia, uh, former governor of Virginia, an uh, entrepreneur, uh, and also somebody who's very much known in Washington for his bipartisan efforts. He was uh, the force and continues to be the force between, behind the Gang of Six, now the Gang of Eight, I guess, which was a group, uh, a informal group of senators, bipartisan senators who are committed to um, to, to uh, dealing with the deficit and, and trying to come up with a, a plan that works. Um, I'm going to jump over to Maya, president of the uh, Committee for a Responsible Budget. Maya is, um, she's one of those policy wonks in Washington that just everybody in Washington knows because she has been sounding the alarm on this issue for years, and not just sounding the alarm, but actually doing something about it. Um, she uh, was very much involved in not only this, the Simpson Bowles Committee, but the, the Gang of Six. She's always there to put together um, breakfast, lunches, whatever, for reporters, for um, uh, bipartisan groups of senators, and so on. Vin Weber, former Republican governor from Minnesota, continues to be known for reaching across the aisle and, uh, <laughs> and being. Uh, and, and very much really uh, also being at the center of this issue uh, is, a, uh, is an economic advisor to Mitt Romney. I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. And, uh, and can provide, uh, he comes from the Republican aisle, but and again, very much uh, willing to work across the aisle on this. Dave Cody heads Honeywell, which is a $33 billion company. And as CEO of that, he presides over 130,000 employees around the world, making everything from fire safety systems to airplane technology. But um, Dave is interesting in Washington because he's, he's also been at the center of this issue. He served on the so-called Simpson-Bowles Committee, which was uh, the president's uh, debt reduction commission. Um, and he has really been, really from the corporate community, at the forefront of this issue, uh, trying to get the attention of the corporate community and the public as well. I'm going to start off by asking Senator Warner to uh, lay, give us a lay of a land. He's got some visuals, I think. Uh, how serious, are we being alarmist about this whole debt and deficit issue? Or um, give us a lay of the land, and, and how do we compare to countries like Greece? I mean, thank you for, thank you for being here. I want to thank Harvard for giving us the opportunity to come up and um, uh, talk to you about this issue. I don't think it's, it's um, uh, we're alarmist, although there may be a little bit of a feeling at times I have a little boy who cried wolf because there were, when we went through the, the debt ceiling debacle last August and there was the fear of the downgrade, um, and when we did get down, downgraded, there was not a cataclysmic result. And then we set up a super committee and when it whiffed, there was not a cataclysmic result. Um, I think there are a lot of factors for that. I, I think it's a little strange that we've almost, it seems like America's rallying cry has become, at least we're better than the EU, right. which, you know, <laughs> or maybe, or, you know, maybe one of the reasons why we've not seen those dire predictions come. But this is only a matter of time unless we act. $15 trillion in debt and counting a debt that we add 4 to $5 billion a day to, none of this self-correcting is going to require the Congress to take a fairly significant step. Only way it can happen is a bipartisan way. 
And <clears throat> that's what a lot of our efforts have been about. I'm not sure there let is Let me just, a, yeah, they're, they're there getting us ready. So let me. I got, I got a, it, well, let me, can I ask you before we jump into this, you, can you flash forward a little bit in, in terms of what kinds of efforts you're looking at sure. jumping into in the next couple months? Well, here's, here's what our plan was, is that this is an issue that is about our economy. It is about, you know, how we get our balance sheet right. But sometimes people's eyes glaze over on that. I think it has almost become much bigger than that. We, we can't cut and tax our way out of this problem. You've got to have a growth agenda as well. But part of what we're talking about here in terms of reform of our tax code or trying to make sure our entitlement programs are going to be there 30, 40, 50, 70 years from now, I think lend themselves a great deal to that, to that growth agenda. And unfortunately, um, because of the disaffection and Congress's inability to grapple with this, or for that matter, pretty much anything else, at this point, this issue has almost become a proxy for whether our institutions can function in the 21st century. So I think this takes on an issue even beyond the economic consequences. Where do we go from here? We're, well, first of all, I, I didn't actually get the memo. I've only been a senator for three years that you take election years off. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not like the rest of the world is saying, okay, we're going to take time out on their economies moving forward while America has an election year. So what our challenge is, and this is, there's much greater bipartisan support than you would, read, you would notice by reading the paper. We're, we were at last count at 45 in the Senate, equally divided Democratic and Republican. We were at 100 in the House, 60-40 Democrat and Republican, but still pretty close to, to equally balanced. And we're, we're looking at trying to do a couple of things. One is there may, and this is the optimism part, be an opportunity, particularly after the Republican nominating process is complete, where both presidential candidates think that it is in their best interest not to have the first action for the next president to be to raise the debt ceiling $3 trillion, which will create an enormous challenge for whomever the, the next president is. And the idea of putting at least a framework in place this spring um, makes an enormous amount of sense. So that's why we have gone ahead and taken the Simpson-Bowles approach put it in the legislative language, you've got a bill uh, that can be scored and meet all the criteria. There also may be the kind of non-optimistic view that while we saw uh, yesterday or today, you know, the 47th announcement that the European Union has finally solved Greece, uh, that this most recent announcement may have the same half-life of the others, and we could see a financial crisis in Europe that could spread to America where we have to act. So, both of those actions are why we need to be ready for the spring. In the same time, we realize come the end of the year, regardless with the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, the payroll tax cut, changes on dividends and capital gains, you know, expir the sequester cuts coming into place, it's going to cause an event. And we need to be ready in a responsible way, so in a bipartisan way, so this doesn't kind of have both parties default to their corners. So what we're trying to start with this effort, and Maya can speak more to it, is to make sure this issue doesn't get buried on the back page and is still front and foremost. Uh, and we need to go around the country and show that there are, and I really appreciate Vin being here, um, but there are active members currently as well who are in both parties wanting to spread this word around. So I think our visuals are up. I'll, I will try to do this. Uh, we've got a great panel here. I will give you the shorty version, although any time a senator says he or she is going to be short and brief, watch out. Um, the first slide back here, you got slides? Oh, good. Okay. First slide is quite simply the point that over the last 70 plus years, America's run basic deficits uh, almost every one of those years. So this is not a Democrat or Republican only problem. Both parties have, you know, in effect, uh, blame uh, or causation on their hands. A factoid that's important on this is that right now, and this will come up, may or may not come up later, federal spending is at 25% of our GDP. That's an all-time high. Revenues are at 15%. That's a 75-year low, 70-year low. The only years that we've had either a surplus, which are those couple years around 2000, or early on back in the uh, uh, 70s, you know, relative close, has been when revenues and spending have been between 19.5% and basically 21%. So it doesn't take a Harvard graduate student to realize if you're spending 25 cents and collecting 15 cents and that the any time you've had a balance over the last 75 years, it's been when you've been in the middle, it means you've got to both decrease spending and find a way to generate more revenues. Next slide. 
This is simply the point that while we've not seen a spike in interest rates to date, that one of the greatest challenges our country and this slowly recovering economy is facing is a spike in interest rates, what we've already seen in, in Europe. Um, if you add one point to our interest rates right now, over a 10-year time horizon, you add $1.3 trillion to the debt. We're at 15 trillion now. You've seen the projections. You ratchet up interest rates two or three points. Everything we're talking about doing right now disappears. This shows, again, the costs of those interest rate increases. Next slide. This one is a little hard <coughs> to see from at least with my eyes at this angle, uh, but it basically shows the differential between spending and revenues and shows that gap at basically an all-time high. And what are we doing right now? That 20, the difference between 25% and 15%, that delta we're basically borrowing from China and other countries around the world, which long-term for our country is not good medicine. Next, next slide. Here's part of the problem. A lot of folks say, you know, who do we blame this on? Is it, you know, was it Bush's tax cuts or Obama's stimulus or you name it. The real problem here is the folks across the river over at the medical school. <laughs> That's because we've set up a, an entitlement program and others that expected folks not to live as long as they live. Bismarck set 65 uh, as the retirement age when he was premier of, Bismarck, uh, of Germany in the 1870s, 1880s, when life expectancy was, you know, about 60. When Roosevelt set up Social Security in 1934, life expectancy was 62. Now, as you see, it's approaching 80, and the amount of time we live longer, thank goodness, and I hope to be a participant in this, means that we've got to, uh, that the basic underlying goals of those entitlement programs, well, while appropriate and appropriate for any society like ours, they are not sustainable uh, with that, that changing uh, demographic. Next slide. This is, again, just uh, as somebody who desperately wants there to be Social Security uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now. And this is where, I, again, just drives home the math point, particularly the folks on my side, don't touch Social Security, don't touch Social Security. Well, part of this is, again, just demographics. When I was a kid, there were 16 workers for every one retiree. The math is pretty simple. Right now, there are three workers in less than, you know, by the time Social Security starts going into great negative balance, it's down to two to one. The math just doesn't work unless we find a way to propose and prolong Social Security at a longer rate base. Next slide. This one uh, actually might be for a specific class because it can actually, this one we could spend a lot of time on. <laughs> um, but the two takeaway points are, one, you know, people keep thinking, how do you raise more revenues through tax reform? Well, right now in America, we raise about a trillion dollars a year on income tax, for the income tax. We spend 1.2 trillion a year in income tax deductions because that's just government spending by a different name. So you could actually cut everybody's tax rate in half and generate more revenue if you were willing to get, eliminate all deductions. Everybody says, yeah, 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 until you look at what those include. Mortgage interest, charitable, healthcare exemptions. The other part on the other side is something that I would wager that the vast majority of members of Congress in both parties have never really looked at, which is where do we spend? And the two quick takeaways here are, one, you show that tax expenditures actually are the largest area of government spending. And two, that the area, and this may be more kind of mine on the Democratic side, but the area of non-defense, domestic discretionary spending, which is all that we spend at the federal level on education, research, infrastructure, energy, law enforcement, early childhood, all the kind of things you normally think about government-wise, that piece of the pie is only 16 cents on every dollar. And most of the cuts so far have come out of that piece of the pie. Now, it, you know, we could argue about where that needs to be, but you, you could eliminate all of that and still not get us back into the debt-to-GDP ratio going in the right direction. So the point of this slide, beyond those of you who are graduate students wanting to learn about arcane federal budgeting, is that the only way we get at this problem is if we look at the tax expenditure side and the entitlement side. So that means the Democrats and Republicans got to get out of their foxholes. I think that's the last slide. Is there any more? That's it? OK. That was the fastest was I've ever done. That was very that's, good. That's Thank all you know, know. I've got to tell you. That's, that's it right there. I've got so, a 35 so, picture. So let's take it. this conversation political. And, and this is a question for both Vin and Maya. I'm struck that sort of like late in 
um, 2010, there seemed to be tremendous public um, support for doing something about the debt. And we had, we had the uh, President's Debt Commission, Simpson Bowles, which fell short of just, what was it, three votes mm -hmm. of getting the supermajority it needed to um, actually endorse it. Big, bold plan, was attacked by the left and the right, which is kind of what you want, right? Um, so we had that, the, the President sort of studiously avoided embracing it. Um, and so it didn't go anywhere. And then we flash forward, we have these debt ceiling battles. And then we have this super committee, you know, big brouhaha over the super committee this fall, which spectacularly failed. What is going on? Well, I, I, I think both, and you have to get to the political motivations of both parties. And I want to say, I think both parties are making a political miscalculation. But the political calculus for the Democrats has been sort of we'll, uh, we'll accuse the Republicans of cutting Medicare and Social Security, and so we don't want to deal with it because we'll let that hang out there. And the political calculus for the Republicans, at least for much of last year, was to the extent that we can prove that the government is paralyzed in dealing with debt and deficits and things like that, uh, debt increase, debt ceiling increase, we'll make the president look bad. That's the political calculus. If that sounds cynical, I'm sorry, it's Washington. But I, I think that both parties have made, this is one of the interesting things about this subject to me, I don't know what, what Senator Warner or Maya think about, I think both parties, as they, as they very rarely do, have made the wrong political calculation about this. Just politics. Senator Warner laid out all the economic consequences. Just the politics of it. The Democrats are going into this election now with the debt being a bigger issue than it has probably ever been politically in our lifetimes. Maybe when Ross Perot ran in 1992, but other than that, it's never been the cutting issue that's been for. Republicans are going into the election having to defend tax cuts for the rich and prospective cuts for Medicare. If they had reformed Medicare and the tax code, both of those issues would be off the table. So one of the reasons, that you can, that's either an, a, a good news story or a bad news story, but to me it's a, it's a good news story, because I prefer to be optimistic, there's a good political calculus to tell the members of Congress and the administration if they want to listen as to why they should do this. You're not asking people to jump off the cl cliff and commit suicide. You're asking them to do the right thing for the country and something that is in their own political interest too. But can I push back on that a bit, Min? Because it, I, just two things jump out. You're a journalist, me. I expect. Right. Push so back. Um, raising the retirement age deeply unpopular, pretty, pretty astonishing, or, okay. or cutting, or the Paul Ryan plan to reform, even a version of the Paul Ryan plan would be to, to, to reform Medicare, deeply unpopular. Can I make, excuse me for monopolizing. No, That's a really important point. But we have a case study on this. In 1983, we raised the retirement age, and we cut benefits by slipping the COLA for Social Security recipients, and the next election was an incumbents election. President Reagan, won, who signed it in law after all, won 49 states. And the Democrats actually held their losses in a Reagan landslide to a very minimal number. It was nobody really paid a price hmm. for raising the retirement age, slipping the coal, and by the way, add, uh, increasing the payroll tax too. My point about this is you don't get beat on these issues for what you actually do you get beat for what people think you might do. And for all of these folks that are running for re-election, they are better off acting hmm. and explaining to the country what it is they've actually done than letting their opponents go out there with 30 second ads and caricature in very negative terms what they might do. Hmm. Maya, and I should, by the way, mention that Maya is an alum. Uh, you got your master's in public policy here? I did, I was just sitting here and thinking how nice it is to be back in the IOP and that it was 15 years ago, and I spent the whole two years here thinking about how to fix the fiscal environment, and I am still <laughs> thinking about the so exact dumb. same thing, so I'm actually feeling really not accomplished right now. Um, I, I would mirror what Vin said in terms of, it is a very strange moment where it seems to me that both political parties are telling themselves a narrative about why waiting till after the election is in their best interest, and that both of them are completely wrong. Um, and I think the miscalculation is that generally, if you're a party and you have a different worldview, and as a political independent, I sort of have no judgment on if there's a better or worse worldview. You can, you can hope that you can push your agenda. But this isn't about what anybody wants to do. This is the hard work of cleaning up the mess of years of overborrowing. And really what both parties should want is the political cover is as much bipartisanship as possible when they get this done. And if Republicans think 
that they're going to take the Senate and take the White House and come into office and fix all of this on their own terms. Right, right. The worst thing that they could do is be stuck trying to fix Medicare and Social Security without Democrats like Senator Warner or Senator Dick Durbin coming to the table and helping them do that and coming up with a plan that can work in a bipartisan way and give them cover. And the worst thing that Democrats can do is hope that they maintain the White House and whatever majorities that they do, and then come out and realize that, guess what? You can't get there just by taxing millionaires. This isn't going to be kind of the easy way out that either party would sort of portray it as. It's going to be really hard. And when you're talking about a four to six trillion dollar plan of savings, what you need is political cover. And the best thing that could happen is that we get this done early in advance of the election. The next president then actually has an opportunity to pursue an agenda. Um, and I would just, if I could, just take a minute to talk about why not only do I think it's the right political thing, but from a policy perspective, there are so many important keys here. From a macroeconomic perspective, the notion that the federal government can borrow right now more than a trillion dollars a year out of the economy and allow that to, to have enough money for private sector investment and growth is just wrong. The notion that the budget can survive when you're borrowing this much and your interest payments are growing so fast, they're going to be squeezing out all the parts of the budget, whether you care about spending more on investments or having more money to cut taxes. If you're paying more in interest every year, and if interest rates go up just one percentage point, that would cost us another $1.3 trillion in interest payments over a decade. What a waste of money. If you're a business leader, there is absolutely no way that you can make investments, that you can think about the long term when you know that our fiscal policies are going to change over the next decade, but you have no idea how. And so as we're thinking about an economic recovery, one of the best things we could do is add the stability of having some kind of 10-year plan in place. There's intergenerational arguments, right? The bottom line, right, is that we're just spending a lot and unwilling to pay for it and therefore giving the bill to our kids. It's, it's not that much more complicated than that. And so the standard of living is not going to grow nearly as quickly as it used to. Um, there's a fiscal risk, which is we just had a huge crisis. Um, and granted, I think all of us would argue that you don't want to put these spending cuts or tax places in, in place immediately. You want to put them in very gradually and let the recovery have time to take hold. But if we hadn't been able to borrow when that crisis hit, we would have been in much worse shape. And right now our debt levels, which are so much higher than they were when we went into that crisis, would preclude us from borrowing and helping if we had another crisis. And in the end, where we're leaving ourselves right now is vulnerable that there could actually be a fiscal crisis. And so I think the political narrative is wrong. But I also just think the policy arguments for doing something as quickly as possible are so compelling that it's sort of an abdication of responsibility or leadership not to be pushing in that direction. And that's why I think business leaders and political leaders who are pushing are sort of at the forefront of what we need to be doing. So you've talked about there are smart ways to cut the budget and there are mindless ways to cut the budget. Could you briefly give us an overview? Yeah, I mean, all of this, it is, it is really difficult to get a four, five, six trillion dollar plan in place. And there's no guarantee that if you do, that it would fix the problem. Because it has to be one that's also consistent with growing the economy. And the bottom line on this is, you can't grow the economy so much that you can grow your way out of this. You hear a lot of people sort of peddling, if we just focus on growth, this problem will go away. And if only that were true, but it's not. You can't cut taxes and grow the economy. Uh, you can't grow your way out of the fiscal problems. There's no free lunch here. But you can make policy changes that are consistent with growth and make it easier, because it's very hard to fix this problem if we aren't growing. So on the spending side, I think we need to really think about how we look at our budget. So much of it right now, which is goes to consumption instead of investment, because the political system is very short-term oriented. Um, so how you refocus it and, and spend more on things that have returns in the public sector and grow the economy. And likewise, on the revenue side, I would make the case that you can't possibly do this without raising real revenues. But you can do that in a way that actually helps the economy um, and the kind of tax plan that both Simpson and others, the Gang of Six, have talked about, which broaden the base, broadens the base and brings down rates and raises revenues, can actually help the economy, whereas just you know, hiking up rates on things that you actually want more of, like saving and investment, could harm the economy. So you can do it in a dumb way and it's not going to work, or you can do it in a smart way that's going to help grow the economy. I want to get back to you on that, um, about infrastructure spending. But let, let me go to Dave. I'm really interested on, uh, from an on-the-ground business perspective, in addition to your work on, on Simpson Bowles, what would a fiscal, we hear this, this term, there could be a fiscal crisis. What would that look like, A, and B, how does the growing national debt affect your business, mm -hmm. De or does it? Uh, well, it doesn't now, but it will at some point. And uh, 
getting back to, first of all, I agree with everything everybody said, as you might imagine. That's I uh, wholeheartedly agree. And uh, we can look at it, and some people will say, well, wait a minute, your interest rates aren't going up now, so what's the problem? The, the problem with markets is that's absolutely true right up until the day it isn't. And it's not like you get a warning. So you, don't, you can't plot on a chart and say, you know, I've just noticed the 10-year note has been going up one basis point a week for 30 weeks now. So if I plot this <coughs> out, the crisis happens here. It doesn't happen that way. It just happens. And all of a sudden, everybody gets nervous and rates spike. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's just all the Wall Street guys. They'll lose some money. Bond rates go up. Bond market crashes. So what? But here's the way to think about it. If the 10-year note, for example, for the U.S. goes to 7%, that means home loans are 10%. Auto loans are 13%. That affects Main Street. All of a sudden, everybody has to hunker down, stop spending, and you get an immediate crisis in the economy. And that will happen. And it's not like you can predict when it'll happen. It happens when the herd decides to turn against you because they don't trust you anymore. And there's this old saying, and it is true, that markets are ruled by two emotions, greed and fear. And if fear overtakes them, like it did four years ago, You'll end up seeing a recession that's worse than what we just went through, because there'll be no place to go. Like Meyer said, the money's already been borrowed. In this last recession, we were able to do a lot of borrowing and just keep spending. That's not an alternative we're going to have next time. So we need to get out in front of this. When it comes to the political side of this, I've got to admit, I'm, uh, one of my learnings being on the Simpson-Bowles Commission was I am not a political savant. So I never quite, and in fact, there were conversations that I was clueless about, and remember at one point saying, it almost sounds like you're trying to protect yourself against yourselves. And the answer was, yeah, that's actually pretty insightful. That's exactly <laughs> what we're trying to do. Said, okay. But it's almost like both parties are engaged in simultaneous asphyxiation. Right? It's like each has the other by the throat and is just going to keep choking, saying it's higher taxes, no, it's lower spending. When at the end of the day, the answer is it has to be both. And we talked earlier about this. I'm amazed at the political discourse. I said, I've never seen anything like this. Everything's ruled by the three H's. Hysteria, histrionics, and hyperbole on everything that gets talked about down there. In fact, more than once I turned to other committee members and said, I don't know how you get your jobs done in this environment. This is ridiculous. You, you can't have any kind of logical discussion. Well, I'll give you an example in the tax versus spend. If you were to take a look at the Simpson-Bowles proposal, which uh, recommended $4 trillion in total, about a trillion in taxes, $3 trillion, trillion in spending reductions. And can I just jump in and just, could you give an overview to the audience of what some of those were, just quickly? Some of? Uh, so, so, some of the, both the spending cuts and tax. What oh, okay. were the base bullet points of Simpson-Bowles? Yeah. Well, on the tax system, which I thought we actually did a pretty good job of, and probably because I was very much involved with that one, but still. Um, at the end of the day, we did exactly what the senator was talking about and took a look at all those tax expenditures and said, stop doing this, just lower the rate, and just nick the rate a little bit so that we <coughs> reduce it. And if you said, okay, if I actually gave everything back in tax expenditures, so it's 23% that everybody would pay at the top rate, still progressive, uh, we'll make it 24 and a half. And as a result of that, you actually raise a trillion dollars over 10 years. If you looked at the spending side, what we tried to do is affect everybody equally. Uh, getting back to the point you were making earlier is that if everybody's annoyed, you probably stand a chance of making that happen. The only two things that uh, gave me any hesitation were that uh, we didn't re it wasn't big enough. Four trillion does not solve the problem. It is a great down payment, but even at four trillion, we will have to most likely do this again at some point in the next seven or eight years. Uh, the second big item was it never addressed Medicare, Medicaid. And the other chart that I would add in there is if you take a look at the cause of the first $10 trillion in debt, it's going to be diff a little different than the next $10 trillion in debt. Because this next $10 trillion tranche that's going to get added is largely because my generation, the baby boomers, are retiring. And we're retiring in such numbers that we are going to crush the Medicare, Medicaid system. There's just not enough money to be able to support it all. For those who think that uh, no growth will solve that, uh, to the point that uh, I think, Nina, you were uh, making, or Maya, you were, that if you take a look at that projection where I said another $10 trillion gets added, that assumes 
GDP, nominal GDP growth of 4.6% a year, and it assumes that Medicare Medicaid growth moderates from about 10% in the last decade to about 6% in this coming decade. So there's some pretty optimistic assumptions in there. And we need to, unless we start having that discussion, I don't know, and do it in a rational way without the three H's, I don't know how these guys ever get their job done because this is clearly a problem. It clearly has to get discussed. And we can't engage in simultaneous asphyxiation. We have to really have that discussion that says, okay, this is a real problem. What are we going to do? I'm going to throw out a couple more questions, but let the audience know you can ask questions shortly. Um, make sure you have a question mark at the end of your question and uh, keep it short. Uh, and th there's mics here if you want to line up. Um, what about the Standard & Poor's downgrade? It seemed, a, it seemed like a turning point crisis on some level, and on the other hand, we sort of passed through it six months later. It seemed less so. What, what do you all think? You know, I was surprised there were not a greater reaction. I think world, the world market focus, though, had shifted to Europe, and their problems took the attention away, and again, we looked good by default. You know, so it gave us perhaps some more breathing room, which is great, but to squander that breathing room by simply kicking the can down the line is just totally irresponsible. Um, you know, the point is, we don't, you know, because we're the currency of last resort, the largest economy in the world, the folks who look on a relative basis compared to most of the other West, halfway decent. We have, as, as Maya mentioned, the ability to not just do these overnight the way they are trying to do in Greece or to a lesser extent in the UK. We have an ability to phase these in so you don't end up raising revenues so much or cutting spending so much in, as the economy is still on the recovery path that you strangle that recovery in its, in its foot tracks. So, Again, all this again still continues to, to make the case of why we need to act. And to the point I, I would agree with, again, all my friends' comments here, I also concur that this is not just good policy, but good politics. Um, the people always say, you know, if you ask the question on a poll, do you want to have you know, your Medicare change, your Social Security change, do you want to raise taxes, people are, of course, going to say no. If you say, here's a fair and balanced plan that everybody is going to have some skin in the game to actually put the country back on a sustainable path, I'll take that argument any time in front of any group, left or right, and I'll take my chances on that as an elected official. It, particularly when the country has such, candidly, low expectations of their elected officials doing anything that's in the country's best interest. So let's take that opportunity. Views on the S&P, and, and yeah. also do you see any further possible downgrades I mean, I think one of the most stunning things about the S&P downgrade was that it showed, it showed two things. One, um, it was based on political dysfunction as much as the right. economic risks, and it proved that completely true, right? They basically said, it appears that your democracy is incapable of coming up with solutions to a clear and present danger, um, and th we were downgraded. And then we spent the next months continuing to fight about it, finger point about whose fault it was. We appointed a super committee, which failed to come up with even a trillion dollars in savings, let alone the amount that we need to. Um, and unfortunately, they were absolutely right that this is a political dysfunctioning system right now, and we have to figure out how to turn that around. It also um, drove home this really just difficult economic position where every time something bad happens to the world economy that we cause, money comes rushing to the US yes. because we are the safe haven. Right. And uh, we are not the safe haven because of anything good that we've done. It's right. only because we are better than everybody else yeah. and they are in really bad shape. And that is never a good you know, annual report to give to somebody is why they should invest in you. And in the end, it goes to Dave's point, that's why when something turns, it will turn on a dime. The moment that there is really the belief that money is going to start to leave the US, it is going to be so fast. And what we're experiencing right now is a teaser rate-like situation, right? The credit cards give you a teaser rate. That's what the U.S. has, where rates are so low, mm -hmm. it lulls us into complacency. You read people even making arguments, don't worry, rates are so low, we should probably just be borrowing more. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that that's not going mm -hmm. to last. And sort of the irony of that downgrade was that we caused this problem that made rates come even lower, and it, and it made our debt dependency yeah. even worse. So. Um, unfortunately, I think they were right to downgrade us at the time, and I actually think that we are in great jeopardy of another downgrade because there was a lot of talk about removing the sequester 
at the end of the year, we have a very bad policy, which is going to be across the board spending cuts. Completely the wrong way to change the budget. But there were some of um, the other rating agencies that said, we're not going to downgrade because there's a sequester in place. But if there becomes a political movement to get rid of that sequester, it's just once again going to show that the US doesn't have the appetite to make the hard choices. We could have another downgrade. And obviously, we're vulnerable to that being the one that really is the tipping point. And the timing of that? Of when another downgrade would happen? Yeah. When, yeah. It, it could happen before the election. There's certainly a real risk of that. You've been seeing signals that right. were not free and clear. If the rating agencies don't downgrade, they're going to have to just fly in the face of what they've already said. Yeah. Their own credibility is on the line here. That's why I think Maya is completely right about it. S&P and the other ratings agencies have said that we're going to have to downgrade if we don't meet certain criteria, and we're not meeting any of them. I, I'm frankly a little surprised we didn't have another a bigger downgrade uh, already by now. Wow. Yeah, Vin, right. speaking of just political dysfunction, I wanted to ask you, the narrative in the press is, tends to blame Republican obstructionism. Um, oh. What would you say? Well, the, the, both parties have, have some blame to take. Uh, I think the House Republicans bear some blame because of obstructionism over the issue of revenues. There's no question about that. But I have to say, I think the president's refusal or N neglect to embrace the bull simpson Deficit Reduction Commission was the one opportunity, the best opportunity we had to break all of that. It's not going to be easy, but, but bull simpson laid out the right framework to get past the Republican objection to raising revenues, which is a growth-oriented tax reform that actually generates higher revenues. And I, you know, I understand, I think, why the administration didn't embrace it, but that was the opportunity to break through this. That doesn't excuse Republicans, but it does it was the biggest opportunity, in my view, that we had to have had a different trajectory over the course of the whole last year. Right. Dave? Yeah, regarding the, uh, I guess, a couple things. Regarding the market reaction first, the way I would describe it is we were the best looking one in the ugly contest. We shouldn't confuse that with being pretty. <laughs> right, those, are, those are two different things. When it comes to the, uh, getting, back, getting back to the three H's, if you were to take a look at the Simpson Bowles proposal, and why I think there's room for a normal discourse here in supporting all the points that were made. If you took a look at the tax increase, the trillion that everybody wants to focus on and talk about what a big deal that is, if you take a look at that over the 10-year period, there's actually about 50 trillion in taxes collected. So that additional trillion is really about 3% more in total when you, that, that's what the number actually rounded to. So a total of 3% more than that. If you take a look at the spending cuts that everybody, I mean, you pick your favorite word, you guys have heard them all on the drastic, draconian, dastardly, everybody has their favorite word on how you're destroying whatever group uh, somebody wants to point to. If you take a look at that 10-year period, there was an average annual growth rate in spending of 5%. If you take out that $3 trillion, the average annual growth rate in spending goes to 4%. So it's the difference between a 3% increase in the overall taxes collected and a reduction in the spending growth rate from 5% to 4%. Yet I've never seen the kind of words that are put around what I think are, in a, in, if this was a business situation, you'd say, wow, I had no idea it'd be this easy. Boom, boom, you'd be done. But I can't believe the dialogue that goes around this stuff instead of actually being able to have a rational discussion with the American public that I think, I, I would agree, I'm, think that when you say, do you want higher taxes? No. Do you want uh, lower benefits? No. But if you said, are you in favor of a system that is going to destroy your kids and your grandkids because you will have spent all their money and forever ruin their lives? No, probably not. I probably wouldn't <laughs> want to do that. It, it depends on how you ask these yeah. questions. And we haven't had that discussion. And one of the things that concerns me is we're in an election year and we're not talking about this. We're not talking about the baby boomer generation retiring. And if we try to do this next year, you can just see it'll be like uh, when President Bush tried to get Social Security reform. Everyone will say, well, wait a minute. We didn't talk about this in the election. What are you doing bringing this up now? You, you should have talked about this if you wanted to do it. We need to be having that discussion out there now. Dave, uh, let's talk about China briefly, and then I want to get to a question. Um, obviously. People know that um, China is the, the major foreign holder of our debt. It, could, could China... Actually, would, America is still the biggest holder, holder of, of our own debt. So, sure. so I said foreign country. <laughs> um, could 
it's two questions, I guess, or could or would China um, provoke a debt crisis or cause a debt crisis in this country? I, I don't think so. I, uh, I mean, my view is uh, China is going to, uh, they they're the sec world's second biggest economy today. Uh, if they keep growing at 7%, we grow at 3 In 30 years, they will be the biggest economy, and they still won't have our standard of living. So they can grow at the 7% rate for a long time, and they know that. Uh, precipitating a crisis with the world's biggest economy, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean that somebody hasn't had that conversation or they haven't thought about it. But at the end of the day, I, I just everything I've seen says they're smarter than that. And that's not, now they're not looking to lose money in this either, and they're not looking to keep putting money into a place where they may not get it back. So they're not interested in that either. But I don't see them trying to precipitate a crisis over debt. I just, it's not in their interest, it's not in the world's interest. Chinese are desperately concerned about the slowing of the growth rate that they've talked about. I mean, they used to grow at about 10% a year. The new five year plan is going to be down to seven. They're fearful it's going to go lower than that. And if you look at what's happened in the country over the last, nine months to a year, there's been a serious problem in terms of social crackdown within the country that most observers mm. attribute to their concerns about unrest because of the slowing economic growth rate in their own country. So there, I agree with that. They're not going to do anything that, in, that risks any growth at all in their own co economy, and that's what they would do if they tried to take it out on us. If they stop lending, that's also not good. It doesn't... Right. It's not them going out of their way to sell all the debt they have, but they could make things pretty difficult just by not buying anymore, saying, look, I've got enough. Uh, I mean, there's, there's talk exposure. that they are putting more into natural resources and, and, you know, their investments, their shifting investment plans, if you will, a bit. I don't know if that's how accurate that is, but that, is that they a concern? Also still, they also still need the American consumer to buy the goods that they're making. Right. It drives their 7% growth. Right. So. Yeah. They've got a problem. They are trying to capture natural resources, uh, both develop them internally and over in Africa and every place like that. But they also have, and this is also reflected in their new five-year plan, they've got increasing demands from the newly emergent middle class in their own mm -hmm. country. You know, kind, of, kind of the way I look at it, the, the old Chinese model, old Chinese like 10, 15 years ago, was, was okay, we are going to develop our manufacturing base and pull people out of abject poverty into what we might in this co country call working class status, and they're going to be forever grateful. They're not forever grateful. As soon as they get to working class status, they want better education, they want better housing, they want a cleaner environment. And so the Chinese have a difficulty not only in maintaining the, 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 the old plan, which, because they still got, you know, four or five hundred million people living in poverty, but they now have to meet middle class demands and it's causing them a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have a question? Uh, identify yourself too, I think I forgot to mention that. Good evening, my name is Luciana Milano. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I constantly find myself thinking about these issues and I completely agree that um, a lot of people are very focused on, or at least the, the presidential election is not focused on this issue necessarily. Um, there are issues that I don't think are as relevant, maybe like the um, current healthcare mandate that's on everybody's mind. Um, but. I think that we do need to have a rational discussion about these issues, like you said, with the American public. But how do we do that? How do we get students like myself to talk and care about these issues? And what can we do to actually change if we're not um, in positions like you are? What can we do to change our financial system? Well, you've taken a step by showing up tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Now, honestly, that, that is part of what, what we're doing. Yeah, this crowd would have been three times the size if this had been last year at this time because it was more on, on the front of people's minds. And you know, I also think if you look back, uh, and I think the point was made, the last time our country dealt with this in a you know, much easier, less structural problem was in 93 under President Clinton. But really the educator in chief had been Ross Perot's campaign, which elevated these issues. Remember the lines don't meet, you're too young, but for those, some of the rest of us remember the lines don't meet. You know, so what, if, and if we're going to get out of the kind of the three H's, I love you had three H's, three D's, you know, yeah. the three H's, the, the one of the things in terms of value that elected officials and past elected officials can do at both parties is to say, hey, this is not Democrat or Republican. This is country before we're party. And if we can help kind of build that case this year so that people don't just after the election 
or God forbid, before if there's a crisis, go into their foxholes, uh, we, can, we can make that happen. Now you're going to have to sit through the longer PowerPoint presentation <laughs> to get all the facts. Done. <laughs> but I think your being here is one of the things. And we've got to do a better job of, you know, we're taking this show on the road. You're the first stop on the road show. And it is, it is interesting that it's been this, the debt ceiling debate, which was just so politically charged, and it's hard to listen to. I, I'm sure you guys felt like that. And yet it also, it, it, it's those kinds of crisis moments that get this issue on the front page. I, I agree. You would have had three times the crowd. But just think one, six, one, one nine good months point ago. is that if our country defaults to the position that the only time we act is when we're on the precipice of a crisis. You know, think about you know, how many lives are you destroying by you know, the financial risk, the challenges, the stock market losses, the uncertainty. I mean, that's a crazy way to run the greatest country in the world. So let's do it on a rational basis. I Dave. think your involvement is hugely important. And, and that's what, what this organization is doing, Mine's going around the country not to talk to the members of Congress necessarily in Minneapolis where you're going or Texas, but to talk to the people. And there is a, a responsibility there, which you're meeting tonight, which for the public to get involved and not yield to cynicism about all this. I, you know, I, 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 I came into Congress many years ago with Barney Frank from Massachusetts, and we were good friends. Barney said something once that I thought was pretty funny. He was at a public forum, and, I, and he was getting a lot of crap about Congress is bad here, Congress is bad there. I remember he said to them, he says, you know, Congress has got a lot of problems, but the people are no bargain either. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the challenge here, and what we're trying to meet is you've you got to mobilize the people. Okay, the people can't simply say, oh, all those people in Washington are corrupt or cynical or stupid or whatever. The people have to get involved. I'm going to put each of you on this. Do we going to say something, Maya? Yeah, I just, I, I'm also reminded that when I was here at, at the Kennedy School, um, I was joining the board of a group called Third Millennium, which at the time was a lot of 20-somethings, well, not a lot. It was 20-somethings who were trying to sort of create an interest group that would focus on fiscal issues and, and getting the younger generation involved. Um, and when I say a lot, I think there were 17 members. And so when we finally went to testify, they said, you know, the AARP has millions of members. You have 17, and they're like, the three board members and your extended families. And so we, we were faced with the real challenge of how you get a broad group of people involved in this issue. And it's never going to be an issue where you get a million man march. Like it is a tedious, dry economic issue that's hard to bring down to the personal level, right? It's hard to get people to talk about deficits at their kitchen table when there's so many things that are going on in their lives. But the bottom line is it directly relates to each one of those. And sort of the economic effects of doing this right it's, it can be such an aspirational message of how if we turn around the budget, how we can fix things. And the negative effects, the consequences of failing to do so are so drastic that I guess one of our goals for this roadshow to kind of go around to major cities, um, but is to bring a little bit of the aspirational message to the forefront, to talk about um, how this can work. And I think the first part of it is how Washington can actually be fixed by doing it. And so one of the important things to know about both Ben Weber when he was in Congress, but mainly Senator Warner right now and the group of senators he's working with and the group of House members they're working with is that they're working together, that you have Republicans and Democrats who are sitting down at a table all the time. I mean, week after week after week, hammering out the details of how to try to fix this problem. And I feel like that's something we haven't seen in so long. And we also haven't seen business leaders getting involved in the issue. And so if we can kind of show people that there is uh, a group of, of strange bedfellows who care about this and think that the solution is something along the lines of Bowl Simpson or something similar. Hopefully that gets more people engaged because there's a viable solution. Dave? Yeah, a couple, uh, just a couple of things to add is, one, this issue will get solved. And it, right. the problem is it's going to be one of two ways. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is you borrow so much that it does precipitate that debt crisis and the recession, and it's, you end up going through what Greece is doing, and we, all, we can all see that. That's not how a great country behaves, as the senator pointed out, and we ought to be able to do this proactively, and that's the smarter way uh, to do it. The second point that uh, doesn't get discussed much either, but I think is important, is, uh, and uh, both Meyer and the senator touched on it, is if you go back 20 years ago, there were only a billion participants in the global economy. Today, 20 years later, there's four billion participants in the global economy. We've added China, India, Russia and the CIS states, some Southeast Asian states. 
There's four billion people participating now, yet we still act like we did 20 years ago. And we need an American competitiveness agenda. There's five or six things that I can point to. I'm sure everybody has their favorites. But we've got to resolve the debt. We've got to have an energy policy. Math and science education, the statistics versus what's, what we're doing versus what's going on in China are scary. Same thing on infrastructure. Uh, free trade and having a more balanced, nuanced relationship with China. And I'll have to put my favorite one in there as number six, and that's we need some kind of tort reform. It's, we've gotten out of hand. People in other countries don't want to invest here because they don't understand how the system can cause the kind of results it does. Yet, we're still stuck on item number one. Yeah. We still, we're having a tough time getting past one that looks obvious to the rest of the world. And there are other countries who look at us and think our time has passed. That a once great country can't act any longer. That we've lost our political will. We'd rather sit on the couch and watch the Olympics on TV than actually have a, a participant. Except those same comments were made 20 years ago. And the emerging power at that point was Japan. And we had a debt crisis. And the country got its act together. We did and something. We, and I think, again, you know, the, this is not defeating communism. No. This is a relatively small, and, and you know, everybody extrapolates from their own, to, to point, and I know we've, we've, we're going way too long on one question. Now, let me just, <laughs> but just, you know, I was a governor of a state with a two to one Republican legislature. When we actually, we had structural problems. We made cuts, we changed our tax code, we generated revenues, we got things fixed. The kind of psychic value that came out of that from people actually seeing, and I had a two-to-one legislature of the other party, of actually working together and getting stuff done, there is an enormous value that that would have across this country beyond the economic value, just in terms of restoring faith. And one thing that's interesting about Dave's list of agenda that just struck me, as you said, and I agree with that list very much, this problem is not the hardest problem on that list. We know how to solve this problem. Yeah. Right, you so want to talk about right. tackling a problem we're not sure how to solve? Science and math that you mm -hmm. mentioned. I, I was involved in that both as a member of Congress and since then. That's a difficult problem. Mm -hmm. We ought to be able to solve the debt problem. Can I ask, ask and I'll make this quick because we have some um, questioners. Yeah. Oh, we've got a group here, but, it's not, but this is my, <laughs> my pet issue, so I get to ask one real quickly. The, um, one of the things that we need to, the business community agrees we need to be competitive is investment in infrastructure. And I'm just going to ask Maya real quickly. Can you, because this is something that does cost money as opposed to education reform, you can argue, is maybe more about reform than spending money. But putting dollars out for infrastructure is a spending issue. Does, does that fit with you? Can, you? can that fit in your plan? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, one of, the, one of the challenges we have is that we're spending so much money in places where there aren't high returns. And what we've been doing for years, if not decades, is shortchanging spending on places that are true investment areas, whether that's human <clears> capital, <throat> infrastructure, basic R&D. There's so many places that have been underfunded because we have parts of the budget and those that are associated with health care costs and retirements are the primary ones that are just squeezing out the other parts of the budget. And even if you look at the minor budgetary changes we've made over the past year, what we keep doing is going after this very small part of the budget, domestic discretionary spending, which happens to be where a lot of the investments are and a lot of the safety net programs are. And they're not the problem in the budget. And in many cases, they're shortchanged. But the reason we go after them is they appear to be the easiest. You just cap them. You don't talk about what we're going to do. You just put a spending cap on. And you stay away from the hot button issues of Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, which are the ones that really have to thoughtfully be reformed. Okay. So absolutely, this isn't and just. And other entitlement programs, agriculture, elsewhere. There's a whole slew Absolutely. Of all the parts of the budget that are on automatic pilot, right. mandatory programs don't get the same level of scrutiny or oversight, and they need them. And one of the things we need to bring into the budget process is much more detailed um, oversight, cost-benefit analysis, metrics of how the performance are, and actually use those metrics to inform how we budget. And then you would have much more spending on things like infrastructure and other positive investments. You also get more of an accelerator effect. If you're spending on infrastructure, you're going to get a much greater economic effect than when you do through transfer payments. Hi, my name is uh, Danny Hatton, and I'm a first-year grad student here. And uh, Senator Warner, your last answer uh, was a really good segue to this, because uh, you're talking about political courage and the political in incentives about uh, raising taxes and solving the revenue problem and, and so on and so forth. You're notorious for passing this huge tax increase in Virginia, and yet you left the state house with very high approval ratings, just as a number of other Virginia governors have. And my question is about a political incentive. Do you think that your unique inability to run for re-election 
changed the way that you operated in your state and changed the way that other Virginia governors, as well as other term-limited uh, politicians around the country, approached their decisions and their ability to tackle these kinds of problems? No. Um, because, you know, obviously, it didn't stop me from running from something else. Clearly. <laughs> you know, and, and I actually think, you know, not only did kind of getting our balance sheet right in Virginia work, but we raised taxes. We still got named best managed state in the country. We got named best state in the country for business. We made record investments in education. Got named best state for lifetime and childhood educational opportunities. And my Republican colleagues who worked with me, again, we had a two to one Republican legislature, they all got reelected, even though the no, no tax crowd came after them. So this model of actually doing what we were hired to do, which is not just blame the other side, but actually get something fixed, you know, I, I don't really think it was a term limit deal. It isn't exactly like the states, uh, you know, one of the reasons I've not been a big believer in the term limits is, you know, in, whereas in the 90s I thought about it when I first started thinking about running and you know, maybe it makes a solution. You look at the states and a whole bunch of states have, have put term limits in. California's put term limits in. Has that worked? Not working. The best term limit is an informed electorate. My name is Mike Gordon. I teach a variety of entrepreneurial subjects at Babson College and other schools. I want to thank the panel for uh, the stress that I'm feeling right now. <laughs> and, uh, Good. Good. You know, what, um, what I think you've given us is a very realistic appraisal of the situation. But what I'm going to ask you is, what's the solution to this? Now, we heard the debt is so extreme, $15 trillion, that there's virtually no way to pay it off. If we try to raise taxes, we hurt consumption. If interest rates go up, that has a variety of things that are going to affect the situation. So I would like to um, ask you one thing. First, there's a fourth H, and that's hallucination, which we don't want to be doing. What's the one thing that each one of you would do that would solve this problem? Or even, I think, probably bring the debt to where we could live with it. Senator? You want me to start? Yeah. Simpson Bowles doesn't solve the problem. But what it does, at $4 trillion, and maybe it's closer to five now because we've spent about another year punting, is it moves the debt to GDP ratio. It drives the curve the right direction. We don't have to solve this in 10 years. That's another thing. You know, we, we use this artificial 10 year constraint, not to kind of make everybody, well, of course, this may be the one group that eyes won't glaze over on this, is that the way all of taxes or spending is scored, the referee is the Congressional Budget Office, they view everything in a 10 year window. So everything is talked about 10 years. If we get the, at least the line going in the right direction and create the kind of growth I think this confidence building aspect would have, it won't get solved in 10, but over 20 to 30, because that's when the really explosion of the entitlement costs take place, you're going to get us back on a smooth landing path. And the alternative is, because you can kind of get overwhelmed with this, is that you then throw up your hands, and that to me is just downright un-American. That's defaulting into the notion that somehow we can't solve this. Anyone want to add? The next yeah, pass Simpson Bowles. Okay. I mean, it's, they're Pass putting it into Simpson. legislative language, Great. pass Simpson Bowles, and you but get a good down payment. And I just want to say a couple of the things that are important about Bowles Simpson, which is what they were able to do is come up with a plan that was big enough to stabilize the debt so it wasn't growing as a share of the economy, but also was able to reflect the sort of core principles to both the right and the left. And I think those who participated mm -hmm. in it, they spent enough time working together that Senator Coburn and Senator Durbin, who couldn't be more different, came to understand what the core values that each needed to protect. And as a result, this $4 trillion plan makes a commitment not to change entitlement programs for those who depend on them, to protect the lowest income people, and in fact, to bump up Social Security benefits at the bottom of the spectrum, spectrum and protect all benefits for low income people. Likewise, for the right, it made the agreement that though revenues would be raised, it would do do so in a way that was very pro-growth, including reforming the corporate tax code. And I just think that the lesson learned is that if you do this in advance of a crisis, you can still preserve the core principles, uh, come up with something that's big enough to actually fix the problem, and come up with a plan that's fair. And so everybody who is participating in it feels like it's fair and it's going to get the job done. And that's why I think it's had this great brand and the staying power even when the president failed to 
endorse it and the leadership didn't move with it. It's still there, it's still bubbling, and people really want to see a vote on Bowles Simpson. Who are the who are the forty so you have forty five senators on essentially the equivalent of Bowles Simpson? Who the non forty five? Do they tend to be far left far left? Are they no, all over I mean, the map? I actually think they... if we'd had a shot, we would have got to sixty. Really? Yeah. I have I have a high level of confidence because a number of the senators who are not in that forty five are votes that any journalist would have said, why, why wasn't he or why wasn't she on that list? Uh, they, I think we would have gotten there. Um, you know, I think there are challenges that our political leaders in each parties have at this point in terms of the uh, formal leadership positions where they have to more perhaps take care of the outliers on the, the extremes. Um, so that, that is, we've got to help them too. So that means we've got to keep showing this critical mass. And, and one of the things that we, we didn't have, and this has been... Um, one of the things we're doing, we're seeing press in each city. We're also meeting with the business community. One of the great disappointments to me as a former business guy was not seeing the business community step up in a major way uh, around the debt debacle. You know, not standing up and saying, okay, we will actually realize, and this is where Dave Cody gets the kind of uh, you know, applause he should deserve, in that he said, okay, I'm going to take certain things that some of the tax breaks he's talking about getting rid of, Hurt Honeywell in the short term, but they realize that a healthy country's economy in the long run is the best thing he could do for his company. We've got to get the business community in this fight as well. Hi, thank Hi. you all for your comments. I'm Elsa Kania, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the Foreign Com Forum Committee at the Institute of Politics. And considering all of the challenges that Eurozone countries have had in imposing austerity programs to reduce their debt while still maintaining growth, that Greece and Portugal have actually seen their economy shrink and their debt to GDP ratios increase. I was wondering how comparable the situation is to the US at this point and what lessons we should learn in seeking to grow our, our economy while dealing with these challenges. Yeah, how, how comparable are we to Greece and Portugal? Really? Well, I, I, I think we'll all want to respond a little bit to that. The, the basic components of the problem are pretty similar, but the point I'd make is, that, you know, we're, we're all talking about how horrible our problem is and how difficult it is. The good news is we don't have to inflict the level of pain on people that they are in Greece and Portugal and maybe even in Britain. They are really in a situation there where they are ask, they're going to have to force people to a lower standard of living. That's really hard. We're not there yet. We don't have to do yeah. it. We, yeah, yeah. 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 Said it. Exactly. If we act now, you know, yeah, we got to reduce the growth of entitlements. Yes, we got to increase revenues. But we do not have to yet force people into a lower standard of living if we act now. But if we don't act, we're going to be there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. I'm a freshman at the college. My name's Hunter Fortney. Um, Mr. Cody or Co mentioned that your biggest issue with the Bowles Simpson Commission was that it didn't address Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and if you look at these projections going forward, health care is one of the greatest costs adding to the deficit. Um, I was just wondering what you guys thought of the Affordable Care Act, and if you didn't like it, uh, what would you change about it? And you know, it's coming for the Supreme Court shortly, so it's obviously a current issue. Who wants to start? What do you think? Well, Put on the hot spot. No, no, that's not that's one, a very fair question. One, one of the great ironies to me on this whole health care debate was that the individual mandate notion was actually not an Obama notion. It was the first President Bush's notion under the notion of personal responsibility, that we shouldn't allow free riders, oftentimes young people, who may have plenty of money who've decided not to, choose not to have health insurance, but then show up, God forbid, when they have an accident at the emergency room door and accept, expect you know, the system to absorb those costs. So I think it's, it's, it's a weird place that you know, folks have fought on, on the Affordable Care Act. Second, I think the Affordable Care Act, and I started a healthcare foundation in Virginia, I've been a governor, I've been an employer as a business guy. You know, I'm not an expert, but I know enough to be dangerous. You know, I thought the Affordable Care Act was a very imperfect bill. But the one thing I was, abs I voted for it, but the, because the one thing I was sure of was that the status quo was gonna bankrupt us. And I thought that this would at least shake up the system enough and then we could come back and fix where we'd overreached or underreached. You know, and the challenge right now is you know, the Affordable Care Act is not going to get repealed even if the Republicans win everything. So you know, let's figure out how we can 
fix where it's overdone or you know, underperformed. And the last point I would make, it just it's, the math won't be there because you won't get 60 senators, I mean, not to get into all the details. Uh, the other thing that, that I think is not being um, talked about very much, that is, it was, you know, we're kind of giving a lot of bleak things, um, uh, but I think a very good piece of news is that if you talk to many, many, many hospital systems around today, insurance companies today, today was one of the big dialysis providers, doctor groups, you're actually seeing for the first time in 20 years behavioral change, not perfect, but behavioral change is starting to move us away for a fee-for-service <coughs> basis. With an aging population, increasing medical technology, you cannot have a fee-for-service basis in healthcare and not go bankrupt. So there are some things. It needs to be fixed. And I hope after this election, regardless of the outcome, that you're going to have a more of a collaborative approach on, on some of the fixes. Dave, then the Affordable Care Act uh, has, has the impact on controlling costs of health care. Well, well, so far, we haven't seen any impact from it. So I, I can't opine on that. And I would say, I, I think a lot of people in the business community are waiting to see what the regulations actually say, because there's the act itself, and then there's this very extensive process to actually go through and write, so what does the bill mean, and what does this mean you have to do? And that's the part that scares everybody right now, is they're just waiting, we're all waiting to see what all of that says, so we know what it is we need to be doing and how, how it affects us. So we're all kind of in this transition period now, <coughs> just, just waiting. One of the interesting things we're going to see probably, I don't know if the Supreme Court's going to uphold the mandate or not, if I were to guess, I would guess they will, but I'm not a lawyer. But one of the interesting things will be if they do hold and uphold the mandate, that doesn't mean the mandate goes away as an issue because everybody I talk to in, in the business says the mandate's too weak. It's not going to do what it's intended to do. People are going to choose to opt out. And so we're going to have to debate strengthening the mandate. But whether you like the health care reform bill or not, one thing <coughs> that, that even the authors of it now would acknowledge is that it didn't do enough to control costs. And part of the challenge is we don't know how to fix the health care problem. Of all the problems out there, you know, we know how to fix Social Security. We have a lot of ideas on taxes. This is a huge challenge where you're going to have to go back over and over and over <coughs> again. But one thing that happened as, as is likely to during political battles is all the pieces that were first there to control costs got taken out or watered down or phased in very gradually. And so we will have to go back and either strengthen those pieces or add some of the other ideas from other models for controlling costs. If I could just add, add something there uh, on the cost control side of it. One of the things that I was very encouraged by early on in the process was a focus on quality. This idea that, because okay, we're very much believers in that, and we do this on the product side, and we've also been trying to do it on the medical claim side. Very difficult to do, because we just don't have all the same data that others do. But it's the variability in outcomes from one hospital to another, one state to another, another doctor to another, is incredible. The variability is huge. And actually, uh, the Dr. John Wenberg up in Dartmouth has done some great work on this to show changes between, for example, if you live in uh, Santa Barbara, you're nine times more likely per capita to have back surgery than if you live in Providence, Rhode Island. So you do all the correlations, and the biggest correlation is that per capita, there are nine times more back surgeons in Santa Barbara than there is in Providence. And we take a look at uh, just the We've set up systems where you can work with a Mayo Clinic to actually figure out is the diagnosis right, does it make sense? And we have a third of employees who actually change what their doctor recommended based on talking to the Mayo Clinic. And we need to be doing more of that sort of thing. And that started out in the early part of the discussion and just seemed to totally disappear. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to see a lot more quality focus. If you look at a lot of the healthcare systems around, there's a quiet transformation is taking place that the press hasn't focused on, others haven't focused on, that in the last six or nine months, last year or so, you're starting to see some behavioral change in terms of how these folks are thinking about the payment system. Because around a lot of this is how you compensate folks. Yeah. And healthcare inflation is actually moderating. Right. Question Thank you. Hey, not not all the news is bad. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zach Sullivan. I'm a first year master's student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I've been in mind at the beginning you talked about how, you know, working across the aisle and solving this problem shouldn't, shouldn't be a negative for anyone. Um, Senator Warren, you've also talked about the need to work together, and yet we don't see that happening. And it seems as though 
you know, in, especially in primary elections, now working on a bipartisan basis is actually a negative. Um, the thing that strikes me, we're now seeing Newt Gingrich attacked for filming an ad with Nancy Pelosi on the environment of all things, which didn't used to be political. So do you see this as a real issue holding us back? And if so, how do you diffuse that as a campaign issue? Who wants to start? You mean bipartisanship is an issue? You know, I, look, I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm torn a little bit because I agree with you that we've seen a kind of polarization and gridlock in Washington on, on the big issues. That's, that is, it's, it's, it's different than, you can romanticize the past easily, but it has been worse the last several years, and particularly on this specific issue. On the other hand, you know, for the political system to actually work, you can't hold out for a day when the two parties have no disagreements. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have a situation where the two parties can argue for their basic values, represent their constituencies, and yet find some way of coming together to solve the big problems. It's not, it's not an easy task. And I think you've got to think about both sides of that equation. And there's more, there is actually more of this going on than gets reported. Yeah. You know, the fact that we're at 45 in the Senate, that have acted at 100 in the House, doesn't get a lot of attention. But I think you're going to vote on Simpson Bowles or Simpson Bowles 2.0, we're going to get 60 votes in the Senate. I think it'll pass in the House. When you're put up to something that says, hey, you can either fix something or not, I think most folks will do the right thing. And I, and the other point, I, the, the one thing that does fight me, some of this we see in the primaries, and it's not just the Republican primary, the Democrats are the same way, but particularly some of the new members of the House who say, you know, I'd never compromise with those whatevers. I, I kind of wonder what constitution they took an oath to, because, <laughs> you know, I think one of the genius of the founders was they set up a slightly dysfunctional government to start with. You know, independent House, independent Senate, both had to work with the president. If you wanted a, if you win an election, you know, you got all the juice. There are parliamentary systems that work fine around the country. I think our brilliance has been you got to force that common ground. And I think this, again, I'll come back to my first point. Um, like it or not, and it follows up with Dave's question as well about the, his list. My list might be slightly different, but a lot of them would be the same. But this one is so kind of the overhang. Until we get this one fixed, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're going to get to energy or education or the other things in a meaningful, major way. So this has become the proxy for whether our institutions work. One final question. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm visiting at the Harvard Business School. Um, th thank you for the informed debate. So, so far, I believe leadership matters. And so far, one name that really hasn't been spoken about here is the President of the United States. We've been talking about an hour here, and we haven't mentioned that he just tabled a budget that would increase spending by about a trillion dollars over the next five years. So could you put that into context in terms of leadership on this issue when, fairly or not, the buck does stop the president in terms of leading? I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to end on this note. I was going to put the Democratic <laughs> senator on the spot to convince us that a re-elected President Obama would actually do something on this when he hasn't so far. And I was going to put our Republican former congressman um, Romney advisor on the spot to convince us that, not that Romney will definitely be the nominee, but you know, that he could... He'll, he'll be the nominee. He'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that he will, um, he will have the political stamina, his political will to do that. And we'll make this short. Go okay. ahead. Quick factor. One, when the Gang of Six plan came out, and when we had our, you know, not our full 15 minutes, but uh, at least a half day where it looked like there might be a solution set, you know, the president came out and endorsed our plan. Should he have done Simpson Bowles earlier? That's a very valid, debatable point. But he did come out. I think he desperately wanted to reach a, a, a deal with, um, with Speaker Boehner. Uh, I believe he will be there. I hope uh, whether it's before or after the election in a major way, because this problem is going to get solved. It's either going to get solved in our timeline or the market's timeline. And I'd rather do it in a rational way. You know, Governor Rahm, I do think Governor Rahm is going to be the nominee, by the way. It's taken a little longer than we'd hoped. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've got an interesting cast of characters to keep you all engaged. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I think, you know, if you look, look at the criticisms that his opponents have leveled at Governor Romney, he's not conservative enough, blah, 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 blah. The truth is Governor Romney is a relatively conservative guy, but he's basically a pragmatist and a problem solver. If you look at what he has, what has characterized his life, he's had to enter into negotiations and do deals, whether it's in business or to solve the Olympics problem. 
And I really believe that, the, or as governor, I'm mean, dealing with a Democratic legislature, as Senator Warner had to deal with a Republican legislature in, in Virginia. He's a person that likes to solve problems, and he has shown an ability to do so and to work with both parties and opposite parties when it wasn't in a political context in doing so. I really believe, as president, he will be a very pragmatic problem solver. Yes, right of center, but pragmatic and interested in doing and getting something done. The right. Romney campaign disavows those last statements. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid you're probably right. <laughs> so My I think day. I would just give a little bit more of a critical assessment on both sides. So what's, <laughs> what Senator Warner said is that, that President Obama will be there when the deal comes. And that's just not using the bully pulpit to deal with the number one fiscal and economic issue facing the country. I think that's not good enough. I think he should have used it to set the agenda. Um, likewise, we're going to release, we have this program called U.S. Budget Watch, which looks at all the candidates as they're running for president and the fiscal effects of their promises. We're going to release our first report on Thursday, uh, and not to scoop ourselves, but we're just looking at the four Republicans. Um, none of them do a very good job yet. So none of their promises are going to set us on the path to fiscal sustainability, to put it generously, so far. So um, what we're lacking is leadership across the board. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of leadership coming from within the House and within the Senate. And Senator Warner and Senator Chambliss and the Gang of Six and the Group of 45 and the 100 in the House, they have been courageous. And that's what leadership is going to take on all of this. Um, but it's also going to take something from all of us, right? And I realize that I might be the only person who goes to the voting booth and seriously is like, now, who's going to raise my taxes the most? And who's <laughs> going to cut my spending the most? Um, but it is going to boil down to us demanding from the candidates that they talk about a detailed plan for how they would stabilize the debt in order for that kind of leadership to emerge. And clearly, it is lacking on both sides right now. Hey, I, I, I felt at least the good thing about it was that uh, it started to broach that $4 trillion number again. And the more that number gets discussed, and each, everybody can argue about what the composition ought to be, but that's what they should be arguing about, as long as people are precipitating that argument politically, I'm all in favor of it. So they can argue it's too much from taxes or not enough in spending or doesn't address this, doesn't address that. That's fine because there is no perfect plan. But they got to be having that discussion. So I'm all in favor of anything that precipitates that discussion. So you all are taking this, you're going around t taking this on the road, talking to people. Just tell us, give us a preview. You're out there, the four of you together. We're going to hit the road, and it's actually going to be different groups of bipartisan leaders. So right. regularly, there can be different senators, members of the Senate and the House together, go to major cities, engage with business leaders, engage with the media, uh, and talk about the issue. And I think other than the fact that we need to do this, that Bull Simpson or something like that kind of lays out the kind of solution that's involved, what we really want to show is that there is all this bipartisan support in doing something. And how great that is when you hear members from different parties talking about things in a synchronized way instead of trying to clobber each other. It's um, a much needed That's news in itself. Yeah, there yeah, you go. It really and, is, so. Well, I, just, I can't think of four more articulate folks on this subject. And thank you for your insights and wish you luck.